Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. Chase, the digital banking app launched by JP Morgan, has reached 1 million UK customers since launching in September of last year with a 1% cash back deal and fee-free overseas checking card use. This growth exceeds the number of both Monzo and Starling, two other very successful UK neobanks. 10X Banking, the UK-based cloud-native banking technology business, created the platform that powers Chase's entry into the UK retail banking market. The platform provides a scalable architecture that allows Chase to expand its retail banking proposition in the UK and beyond. To discuss why a scalable core banking platform built on microservices and APIs is the key to building a better digital bank, we have Anthony Jenkins, CEO and founder of 10X Banking on the Banking Transform podcast. In 2016, our podcast guest launched 10X Banking with the goal of making banking better. The company's name stands for the belief that financial firms need new technologies that can make banking 10 times better than it already exists. Anthony, I first met you at an event in London where you, when you were with Barclays. Your perspective on what banking needed to do then was spot on, but few foresaw the changes that we're seeing today. What are the biggest changes that you've seen in banking in the past five years? Yeah, in many ways, um, the work that I'm doing now, the changes that we're seeing are things which I first became interested in in the mid-90s. Uh, and I was always fascinated by two fundamental questions. Firstly, why doesn't banking work better for humans? Um, you know, if you think about it, most things that banks do are quite boring, sometimes intimidating for the customer. But actually, they're very important in people's lives. As I always say, nobody wants to get a mortgage. Everybody wants to buy a house. Um, yet the industry has steadfastly refused um, to engage in making those processes a lot easier for the customer. And the second thing was, why haven't we seen real transformation driven by technology? And I guess one of my conclusions around that, because I was I was living in the United States and working in New York City in the early 2000s, and at that time, everybody thought internet banking was going to replace branch banking. And of course, internet banking just ended up sitting alongside branch banking. But my conclusion on the technology angle was technology had to reach a certain point of capability and price point for it to be able to address and transform a complex vertical like financial services. Yeah, you think about other things that we do online, shopping, buying travel, um, social interaction, those things are relatively straightforward when you compare them to banking. And I think the big thing that's changed in the last five years is that a lot of very powerful technology is now available to create a platform like 10x, which can make banking 10 times better. And we say that it's 10 times better for the bank, 10 times better for their customer, and 10 times better for society. So when you look at traditional banking, a Barclays, a, a city, a Chase in the United States, at least, you know, they're big and they can invest pretty heavily. But overall, the, the technology that the banking industry has, has really moved slowly within banking organizations, while fintech firms have often had the challenge of building scale and profitability. What do you see as the key components of a modern tech stack that should be in place in banking today? Yes. And of course, established banks are burdened by lots of lots of legacy technology, which was in many cases designed 30, 40, 50 years ago. So in order to deliver 10x banking, we established two core principles from the start and have since added a third. So the first two core principles, and this goes all the way back to 2016, was we had to design the architecture around the customer, not around the product. And this is really important because if you are a customer of a bank and you have maybe a checking account, maybe a savings account with your partner, maybe a mortgage, each of those products looks as if you're an entirely different customer. And although banks talk a good game about big data, 
actually they have to take that data out of the processing systems, put it in a data lake, clean it up before they can do something useful with it. So the first thing we said was, let's create a customer-centric architecture. That's important for data, as I just mentioned, but it's also important for operational efficiency. For example, when you change the customer's address because they've moved house, you only have to do it once on our platform, regardless of how many products they have with you. The second thing we said was, if you think about all financial products, they basically do the same things. Um, you have to charge a fee. Maybe you have to credit a fee. You have to charge an interest rate. Maybe you pay an interest rate. So rather than build a set of product modules in the platform, a lending module, a savings module, a credit card module, and so on, let's build a set of services or microservices that can be assembled together to present functionality inside the customer-centric architecture which gives us massive reuse. So it means we can build product very quickly and we can do it very cheaply. And the third thing that we've added uh, since the, the original kind of design for Telex was this notion of being multi-tenanted. Um, one of the huge issues for banks to upgrade their technology is migration. Um, these are very expensive, long-term programs which carry a high degree of risk, and indeed many of them have gone wrong, and that's been career-limiting for CEOs and CIOs and so on, and boards to some extent. And the reason why these programs are so complex is because what you're essentially trying to do is take these very old legacy systems and replicate them on more modern technology. What we said was, if we build the new capability in the new technology, then we have to connect it back to the legacy systems, not the core processing systems, but things like general ledger, regulatory reporting, payments, and so on. But because our platform's multi-tenant, once the bank's done that work, they only have to do it once. So for example, you can stand up a checking account as a sub-tenant on the platform, but you can also stand up a savings product or a mortgage product or a lending product. So you only have to do that integration to the legacy once. What that does is it shortens the time dramatically, brings down the cost and the risk. At the same time, because most financial products have a relatively short life, two to three years on average, it means that you begin to book the new volume onto the new platform and just let the old business attrite off the legacy. So it gives you, for the first time, a viable, relatively low cost, relatively low risk path for migration. And so these are the three things that you would want to see in a modern platform. And they're all things we've built into 10X. You, you, you're, you're not only building a digital banking organization at, at Chase and elsewhere, but you also have situations where you're partnering with legacy financial institutions. What are the major differences that you see between starting a digital banking organization from scratch or trying to convert the existing core into a legacy banking organization? What are, the, what are the challenges and opportunities in both cases? Yes, there's, a, there's an old cliche that says you can do anything with enough time and money. Um, yeah. We've spent six years doing this. Uh, it's all we do. I think for most legacy banks, the challenge is this is something they're trying to accomplish alongside keeping the lights on the BAU and dealing with regulatory updates and so on. Um, so they don't have that singular focus. The second thing is, although they have many thousands of technologists in banks, they're mostly um, schooled in the old uh, technologies and old ways of doing things. And it's very hard to attract um, people from the modern technology world into banks because it's not very exciting. Um, part of the reason why people come to work at 10X is because they believe in our purpose and our mission of making banking 10 times better. And they get to work on very complex projects um, you know, with new sophisticated technology. So for us, we believe that you know, this, this process of replacing um, the technology in order to create transformation will much more successfully be done by working with a third party like ourselves in partnership with the people inside the banks. Mm -hmm. But over time, our view is that once this technology is up and running, it allows you to massively reduce the number of folks that the bank needs to employ, whether it's in product development, data and analytics, the technology itself, because 
unlike the old world where the data scientist is spending 85% of their time passing the data and trying to figure out the three different versions of my name is really the same customer, that's all done. It's all done in the 10X platform. We can stream that data in real time. Same with product. I mean, we have a tool called Bank Manager where a product manager, which is a job I used to do, can build a new product entirely on the desktop without any code at all. Um, they can build that new product. There's a workflow that sits around it so it can be authorized by risk, compliance, legal, finance, etc. And once that authorization is complete, it can just go into a queue and be promoted into production. So in theory, you could build a product in a couple of hours as opposed to most banks take you know, many months, sometimes years to get a new product to market. So what that means is your new organization, the bank of the future, will have many thousands of people less in it because they'll have all the tools to do their job. You don't need a huge technology organization now to build a new product because you can build it using our bank manager tool. Anthony, you, you mentioned about converting the core of an existing organization and how this can save on employees and, and improve processes. But at most third-party providers, their biggest challenge is actually being able to implement things the way they know they will work. So in one case, you're going to have a situation that they have back office processes that really really hinder and hamper the conversion to an, a new core. In addition, when people feel that their jobs are at risk, the culture can kind of take a side turn and make it very difficult to implement what you implement. How do you deal with those two challenges? The challenge of the processes behind the core, which are analog in many cases, and the human aspect of, of bringing people up to speed and making them get on board where there's going to be reduction in team? We're basically a technology company that serves financial services firms. And I founded the company from the perspective of a business person. I basically sat down and thought about all the problems I'd ever had in my career and tried to build technology that would address those problems. And so what we've been able to do is really deal with all of the use cases um, that you find in big complex banks. Every bank we sit down and talk to, oh, we're different. You know, we're so much more complicated. We've got all this legacy stuff. And actually, everybody's got the same problems. Yeah, at the end of the day, you've got to onboard a customer. You've got to provide a set of service to, services to them. You might have to offboard that customer at some point. Yeah, these things are, are fundamental and common. And we have built a platform which is capable of serving every customer type from a retail customer all the way up to a large corporate across all of the major product lines, asset and liability. So transactions, savings, lending of different sorts. And all that functionality exists and it will cope with the problems and the idiosyncrasies of banks that they've built up over the years. The more fundamental point is the one you've touched on, which is this at its heart is not a technology problem. It's a people problem. It's a culture and leadership problem. And I was talking to somebody about this earlier today. Many banks have kicked the can down the road uh, because it is too hard to deal with. But actually, we're now at the end of the road. Banks need to deal with these issues because a lot of their existing technology is going out of support. Um, a lot of it will not do what the banks require it to do at the same time as the environment is ever more competitive with fintechs out there and big tech companies. So the banks have run out of road. They can't kick the can down anymore. And that will cause, uh, and we're seeing it everywhere, much greater appetite for this type of activity. But it will manifest itself in different ways. So for some banks, they believe that they can just put in a cloud-based core and that will solve their problems. Um, I think that might solve a hardware problem, but it doesn't really create transformation. That's what I call improvement. You put in our platform, it gives you those 10x benefits. Not every bank will want to go on that journey, um, but there are plenty of banks that do, and we're, we're working with a number of them. So, you know, many traditional financial institutions are trying to decide whether to convert their existing back office to a more digital platform or build an entirely separate organization, a different digital bank to with its own future ready core. You know, Chase, who you're working with, 
abandoned the separate union in the U.S. while building a digital bank in the U.K. If you were in the traditional banking role again, what path would you take? Would you would you put a new core on an existing platform or an existing organization, or would you separate the digital bank from the traditional bank? So I think the uh, the the best path for doing this is to create a new bank to the side because then you can test out this technology in a relatively controlled environment. And then using the multi-tenant capability I described, progressively bring elements of the old bank into the new bank. And ultimately, you can then shut the old bank down. That, I think, is the most effective way to do it. It's the most cost-effective way. It's the lowest risk way to do it. And it allows the bank to essentially reinvent itself in a controlled way. If you try and get in there and fix the legacy, it's going to be very, very complicated, um, time-consuming, expensive, and high risk. And yeah, this is this is exactly why, if you think about you know the automotive industry in the seventies and eighties, they massively invented themselves through the use of robotics. It's very similar to that type of approach because the approach allows people allows humans inside these banks to learn these new technologies and get comfortable with them. And it reduces that kind of fear and that barrier to action that you were alluding to before. Well, it's interesting. It, it, it kind of jumpstarts the whole legacy leadership issue too, because if you're building a separate organization, you by its own nature say, I'm going to let go of all my previous thoughts and, and going to build something different. You know, one thing that's interesting and, and I'm going to get into the chase just a little bit here is that, their scale of growth has been extraordinary since they entered the UK market. I mean, they they have, you know, many, as I mentioned in our intro, you know, they have more customers at a faster pace than, than I think even in some cases they expected. But to be able to do that, you need to build a core that is built for speed and scale. What differentiation do you bring to the table to help organizations that want to grow that quickly? Yeah, and I obviously can't talk about any specific uh, bank or client, right, but right. one of the things that we did, I alluded to the sort of core design principles of the business, um, the the client centric, ar- customer centric architecture, the microservices, the multi tenant, which is the predicate for a lot of the tenex benefits. But the other thing that we did from day one, because we came from the big back bank big back bank background. We knew that we couldn't just build some, you know, MVP that sort of stood off to the side. We had to build something that was enterprise grade, that would scale, um, that was capable of hosting and processing, you know, hosting millions of customers, processing tens of millions of transactions. And and again, when you design that in from day one, it's a lot easier than trying to retrofit it two or three years down the track when you realize you've been a lot more successful than you thought you were going to be. So we designed both functionally and non-functionally a platform that would serve the largest banks in the world. And we did that from day one. Um, and that's what we've been able to stand up for our clients around the world. You know, it's interesting. I, I, in working with a lot of third-party providers, right now we're in a very interesting time. I, I, I look back now and think, boy, COVID was a challenge. But from a solution provider perspective, it, it had a lot more to do with where people worked than what they invested in. Um, we're in a different time period now with the economy and a, and a lot of, lot of doubt, doubt with regard to the economy. How is your organization dealing with scenario planning around the sh- possible shifts in the marketplace, including the unknowns of the economic, economic shutdown, as well as entry of potentially major tech companies or brand new competition? Well, one of the things about <clears throat> founding a company after 30 odd years in business is you have a lot of experience of the ups and downs, you know, the unexpected. Um, and so I've always run this business in a conservative fashion. And the example I'll give is it was very important to me that we got the platform live because you can talk a great game about customer centric architecture and microservices and so on. It doesn't really matter until somebody can see it in action with real customers on it. 
Um, and so that was our focus all the way up to sort of the middle of last year, really, to get live with, with Chase here in the UK and Westpac in Australia, which we did successfully. And I've positioned the business so that um, if, you know, more clients than we expect show, we know how to deal with that. If less clients show, we know how to deal with that. Um, there are sort of random things that we have to deal with, like, you know, the exchange rate, the dollar pound exchange rate moves as it has done. That's a few hundred thousand, you know, pounds of extra cost that we have to figure out how to absorb. We've got inflation to deal with. So, but, you know, I've, I've run businesses for many years. These are not new challenges. There's more volatility perhaps. Um, there's more focus now, I think, from the investment community on businesses that can you know, have a path to profitability. But I always thought about having a path to profitability. For me, there was no merit in, you know, having a billion dollars of revenue and losing half a billion dollars of revenue. That, that didn't, didn't make sense to me ever. So I think it's just about good business management, common sense, you know, knowing where you're taking risk and managing that risk appropriately. Two concepts that are often discussed, but more often misdefined, are the concepts of super app platforms and embedded finance. What do you see as the impact of the shift from transactional banking to engagement banking, where the interactions are more important than the transactions and the scope of what financial institutions can provide? Yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot of fancy jargon there. Um, but it boils down to common sense, right? Um, as I said at the start of this interview, many times financial services is is confusing to uh, customers. It's intimidating. There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of terms. But actually, people just want to do something important to them in their lives. And if you can find a way to do it much better, then you will be successful as a provider. And this is why, you know, buy now, pay later has been so successful because at the point of sale, um, you can essentially finance the purchase of a relatively low ticket item um, and you can do it instantly in a very easy way. Um, there's no obvious cost to you because the retailer pays for it. In many ways, it's as old as the hills. You know, there's, there's that sort of point of sale finance is old as the hills. And of course, people could pay it, pull out a credit card and do it. But it's just so much easier. And for people, they they adopt those things. It's like contact payments. You know, there's, yeah, sure, you can get your card out and stick it in the reader and put a pin code in. But it's so much easier to tap, particularly in things like taxis and, you know, fast food restaurants and so on. So for me, this... It all boils down to what is the customer experience and how can you make that better than doing it the old-fashioned way? And that's why we designed the technology the way we did because it's it's designed to enable that. I was just I'm, – I'm in London and it's the afternoon here. I just had lunch with somebody and, and he was saying how frustrated he was because he had a credit card um, with a big bank he also had a savings account. He had quite a lot of money in the savings account, but the credit card company wanted to bring his credit line down because he didn't use the card very much. And they thought he was a bad credit risk. But he's saying, I've got all this money over here in your bank. I'm not a bad credit risk. But the bank couldn't connect the two things. Now, that's incredibly frustrating for him as a customer because it took him a long time to sort it out. But it's very bad for the bank because it's damaged the relationship between him and the bank. But also, it's cost them a lot of money. And this is one of the things I always say to analysts that track bank stocks. Next time you're sitting with a bank CEO or CFO, ask them about the cost of defect in their business because it's huge. You know, the number of calls that that customer put into customer service and talking to management about you know, thousands of pounds. So it's good for the bank. If you can make an experience for the customer that is powerful and meets their needs in a way that can't, can't be met or can't easily be met in other ways, you, you'll not only create greater loyalty and generate more revenue, you'll save yourself cost. And so this is where the, the magic lies, if you like, where the benefits of 10x banking come from. And all these terms, um, I think, boil down to the same thing. Serve the customer better and you'll win their business. So, Anthony, we were talking about making better customer experiences. And we played around or we moved around the circle of 
you know, the use of data analytics, you know, a, a concept that's talked about, but very infrequently put into action is the use of data analytics and insight to drive personal engagement. Um, even the biggest banks I've had on the podcast have talked about the fact that this is the, really the holy grail, being able to deploy analytics so the customer knows that you know them, as opposed to just simply making great reports. How do you see organizations dealing with these challenges going forward? Yes, yeah, so if you think about financial products, they are just data. Uh, banks have masses of amounts of data inside them. Um, the problem is they can't easily get at it to run the analysis and then take action off the back of it. So most banks invest huge amounts of money and people in extracting data from the core processing systems, putting it in a data lake, cleaning it up before they can then run analytics, produce reports and take action off the back of it. And this cycle times on these things can be you know, measured in weeks and months. And that's particularly important when, as now, we're in challenging economic times where you really want to see how the customer's behavior is changing so that if the customer is getting into difficulty, you can intervene and help them before things get too bad. So what we've done in our platform is we've created everything is real time. So every time the customer makes a transaction, we can see it in real time and we can stream that data to the bank in real time. So no more waiting to go and pull the batch runs from you know the, the core processing systems. If the bank can't consume it in real time, we can also send them a you know, batch file overnight or whatever. But this means that they can not only access the data more quickly, but because the data is all connected to the customer, they've got a complete cust picture of that customer's activity on the platform. So that then allows them to apply analytics. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is having applied those analytics, you then want to be able to take action. And again, you can push action back into the platform in real time. So unlike a business I spent a lot of my career in the credit card business, at this time, um, credit card companies will be looking hard at customers' line usage and deciding where they need to reduce customers' lines on credit cards. But that's still, you know, a batch process that could take, you know, a couple of weeks to do the analysis and then another week or so to push the changes through. On our platform, we can stream you the data, you can make the decisions, and then you can pull those lines down in real time. Um, obviously, you have to advise the customer and follow all the regulatory requirements. But, you know, the actual time it takes to initiate the credit line reduction is almost instant. So the, the ability to use data crucially depends on being able to access it. And our platform provides that access very quickly and easily. You know, it's interesting. As I look at the industry, though, a lot of firms have the data, have the analytics, have the insight into the customer. But it's that final mile. It's developing concepts, communications, engagements that use those insights to drive activity, to drive engagement, to drive action. And a lot of organizations really are challenged, you know, if they're not already challenged by the data analytics side, they're challenged by the fact that while this, all this information is available, they really haven't found a good way to communicate how the customer should act next. So it'd be like you put Google Maps on your on your uh, GPS. It gives you all the information, but it doesn't tell you when to make the turns. How do you see financial institutions, especially traditional financial institutions, building this final mile? Yeah, yeah. it's it's it's, a, it's like what we were talking about before. The the shape, the organizational shape of a bank going forward, and the people within it. It, it will look very different to how it looks today. Um, in fact, in many cases, the banks haven't even bothered to develop that sort of hyper creative um, offer positioning because it's irrelevant. They don't have the ability to offer those uh, new services to the customer in anything like a time frame that would be relevant. Um, you know, one of the classic examples is shopping at supermarkets you know in this country we've got several large supermarket chains i see you shop at sainsbury's um here's a 20 percent off for the next month at tesco's right another supermarket there's no point in running that analysis today because by the time you 
put all that together and push it out to the customer, it could be two or three months and they might change their behavior. So this is a product of the legacy technology and the organizational structures that support it more than anything else. When you change that technology, then you could have a whole bunch of people just sitting around thinking up great offers for the customer based on their behavior. Um, and that might be, oh, I see, you know, you've got, you're making payments to three credit card companies. Um, why don't we consolidate those onto a loan and bring down your interest costs by two thirds, for example. Now that is technically possible today and some banks have attempted it, but it's very slow and very clunky. What you'd want to be able to do is position that offer in the app to the customer. So it's essentially a click and you're done. And so without the underpinnings of technology, it's very difficult to deliver those sort of real time activities. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is I'm a banker by trade and, and started in the banking industry. And, you know, I never take that mindset away from me. I, I'm always remembering how banks do things. I'm sure you do the same thing. You, you're very familiar with the way traditional banks do things. So if you're looking at financial institutions today and fintech firms today, what's the most important area that financial institutions and fintech organizations should be working on to today to be prepared for the future? I think it goes back to that basic sensibility that I was talking about at the start of this interview, where why don't banks serve their customers better? That's the fundamental question. All this technology is just a set of tools to do that, right? Um, people have a set of needs in their financial lives. It depends on their life stage, how affluent they are, and so on. But almost everybody needs somewhere to have a salary or a pension paid into. Um, almost everybody you know, spends money on food and housing, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we optimize that? And it's really going back to first principles and saying, okay, if I could make that um, so much easier for the customer, then I'm going to have no problem with adoption. It's a bit like the difference between going to Blockbuster and renting a DVD and streaming content on Amazon Prime or Netflix. You know, right. Why is that so much better? Because I don't have to leave my house and because I've got vast amount of content that I can consume a much better experience. And we need the banking analogs of those things. And that really goes to sort of taking the stress out of people's finance for them and making sure they make you know, the best possible decisions for them and their families. Right now in this country, um, unlike the US where people are able to access 30 year mortgages and a lot of people locked in really you know, low rates during the COVID crisis, in this country, most people are on one, two, five-year fixed mortgages. As those interest rates um, come off, people are facing really significant increase in their housing costs. How right. can financial institutions help them with that? How can they find the best possible deal for, the, for that individual customer? So those are the sorts of use cases that you can begin to imagine, but you can't do them without the ability to access the data, process the data, make decisions on the data, and then crucially push it back to the customer in something like real time. The equivalent of sitting in your living room and deciding what you're going to stream that night on Netflix or Amazon Prime. So finally, Anthony, what excites you right now in the marketplace? You in the financial marketplace or overall in the marketplace that really really builds an idea of what the future is going to be. You know, one thing, as I mentioned at the beginning of our, our discussion was that, you know, you always had a really keen eye on, on what the future is going to be, bring. What is the future going to bring for financial institutions? Yeah, I, you know, I have a very broad view of that. And, um, you know, my, my view is for every sort of crisis, there's an opportunity, right? So um, one of the things that came out of COVID was we suddenly all got comfortable working from home. Um, you know, for many years, people had said, oh, you know, if people work at home, they're all going to be, you know, idling away and watching daytime TV in their pajamas and stuff. Clearly not the case, right? I mean, we've done incredible work of the team here at TEDx through, through the crisis of COVID. And the interesting thing about that is we all think about Zoom or platforms like the one we're using today. Actually, that wasn't the key enabler of this. It was the fact that we all had broadband at home and we could use that to communicate with each other. So that's one thing that I'm excited about, that it's allowed us to think about work differently and hopefully create a better 
um, work-life balance for folks. Um, the second thing that I'm really excited about is for all the terrible things that are happening in Ukraine, I think it's finally woken people up to the fact that dependency on fossil fuels is a significant problem. And we're going to see acceleration. You can see that in the US, um, energy self-sufficiency and particularly green energy self-sufficiency. And we're going to see that here in Europe as well. And that's a good thing. And then finally, I'd say um, that what interests me about financial services is what I call stacking, where you get technologies stacking on top of each other to create real benefit. Um, and that is a combination of things like apps. It's a combination of 5G. It's a combination of cloud and all the cloud tooling that goes along with the cloud native world. And now we are really starting to see the benefit of those things for the customer. And I, I will give you an example. It's a personal example. Um, I, of course, am a Chase customer here in the UK. Um, when they launched their savings product, I knew they were going to do it, but, but my team told me they'd launched that day. I was able to go into my Chase app and with one click open the savings account. You wow. know, yeah. that is unbelievably good for me as a customer because what it does is it reduces the barrier to action. So customers know that they should have less money in their checking account, more money in their savings account, but it's a chore to go and open the savings account and then move it between the two of them. For me, it was a click or two and I was done. And that's good for me as a customer because I make money on my savings. So I think that this stacking of technologies is finally going to create a financial services industry that actually works for the customer. Um, so these are the sorts of things that I'm really excited about um, for the future. You know, it's interesting, Nancy, and you mentioned it, that, you know, our experiences during COVID woke us all up to what the possible is. You know, you mentioned Netflix and, and Hulu and things like that that I'm really used to. You you discussed the Chase account opening process, and I usually reference the, the Apple card opening process that it is so much different than what you're used to. But the consumer now is not catching up to the banking industry. Banking industry is catching up to consumers who understand there's a lot of times I'm in a, in a, in a party or something like this and somebody goes, why can't banks do X? Reference in the fact that, oh, they have it everywhere else. Why can't banks take what they know about me and make my life easier? And I think the frustration is going to finally show and people are going to actually get off, you know, just sitting back and letting it happen to them and demand better. And and you brought up a great example with Chase's account opening process. You know, it, it takes most organizations 15 minutes to open a new account, even if you're an existing customer, which is insane because the whole first end of it is identifying yourself that you've already done by being a customer. So um, I'm looking forward to what's up in the future. Anthony, I really appreciate being on the show today. And also, um, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts because uh, you, you were right uh, 10 years ago and you're probably going to be right 10 years from now. So great. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. I really appreciate the support you've provided since we started this endeavor. If you enjoy our show, please be sure to provide a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Also, be sure to catch my reach in articles on the financial brand and check out the research you're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Haslidge, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, now more than ever, Banking needs to have the right technology to meet the changing needs of the consumer now and into the future.